Good morning. My name is Wapstam Harper. My membership is with Barrens River First Nation. I'm a 17-year-old student. I was asked to present a historical aspect on Treaty 5. Before I start, I want to mention that Treaty 5 is the foundation of our past, present, and future. My presentation revolves around many ideas and concepts, terms, and timelines. It's a brief overview on how we got here today and how we fit into such a complex political world. These things include the 1st century Roman Empire, 13th century Crusades, fall of Constantinople, 14th and 15th century of discovery, prior to contact of First Nations, first contact, things like pre-confederation treaties, trades and alliances, Royal Proclamation of 1763 and the Treaty of Niagara of 1764, Rupert's Land Order 1870, Canadian Confederation, numbered treaties, specifically our treaty, Treaty Number no. 5 in 1875, the Indian Act, Indian Residential Schools, the Natural Resources Transfer Agreement, the White Paper, Canadian Constitution of 1982, UNDRIP, and the Apology for Residential Schools, and the TRC. These events shape the minds of the white people on Indian policy. Even today, this colonial thinking continues to exist. So we move to the first century Roman Empire. Emperor Constantine Christianized the entirety of the Roman Empire. He expanded territories and conquered people. The concept of expanding territories and conquering people became the same policy towards First Nations in the Americas but they questioned if this was seen as good in the eyes of their religion. That question later morphed into what was the 13th century Crusades after the fall of the Roman Empire. The Christian Byzantine Empire went to war over lands with the Muslims in Jerusalem. Theologians at the time justified these horrid, cruel actions that the Christians did through the just war theory. They justified going against the Muslims and doing horrid things to them. The terms introduced at this time were infidels, heathens, pagans, and savages relating to non-Christian people. The concept of infidels and heathens would later be used to characterize our people. The fall of Constantinople in 1453. Constantinople bridged Asia with Europe. Europe used Constantinople as a post for trade with India, Persia, Turkey, China, and Mongolia and other places in Asia. Europe ended up going to war with people in the territory called the Ottoman Turks. Constantinople later became compromised after Europe lost that war. Europe became very desperate for wealth and resources because their main connection point was cut off. So they looked to alternate routes to Asia which led to the discovery of the Americas. In the 14th and 15th century, something big happened. Europeans traveled to parts of Africa, India, Australia, South America, New Zealand, and North America. With new lands being discovered across the Atlantic Ocean, Pope Alexander VI created the Doctrine of Discovery in 1493 based on previous papal bulls from previous popes. This doctrine gave full God-ordained rights to Christians to take lands from non-Christians. This doctrine is embedded in constitutions around the world today. I want to share with you a small little part of the doctrine. What does it say? This was Pope Nicholas V. Invade, search out, capture, vanquish, and subdue all Saracens and pagans whatsoever. Reduce their person to perpetual slavery. Convert them to his and their use and profit. First Nations prior to contact. We had vibrant nations, traditional trade and marketing networks. We had economical and societal structures, languages, science, mathematics, health and technologies, to name a few. We had sacred ceremonies and knowledge of our lands and territories. We had sacred duties to be caretakers of those lands. We had traditional governments over those territories. We even had hostile relations and made military alliances things like treaties and confederations. And most importantly, we had an all-around sense of kinship and respect 
for every aspect of society based on customs and beliefs passed down from generation to generation to generation. First Nations and Europeans First Contact Jean Cabot, an Italian explorer commissioned by King Henry VII, was to travel across the Atlantic Ocean. In the 16th century, the French explorer Jacques Cartier landed on Turtle Island and had plenty of trips back and forth. Jacques Cartier with First Nations established a relation of trade and friendship. More settlers came from 1500 to 1760s. Settlements of French, Spanish, and British colonies were established along with Christian orders like the Jesuits, Anglicans, Catholics, and other people. Trading posts with First Nations were a big industry that brought wealth for Europe. I mentioned the Beothic people because they were the first casualties that all died off. They're extinct. We as First Nations were exposed to a clash of cultures from Europeans. Germ warfare ensued with Europeans giving disease blankets to us, our people. Confident with French and British settlements expanding into Indian territories. So we moved to the Royal Proclamation of 1763 and Treaty of Niagara 1764. After nearly 300 years of being exposed to Europeans, First Nations wanted change. Chief Pontiac created an army in order to drive the Europeans back to where they came from. King George III of Great Britain realized that the settlers created great frauds on behalf of his empire. King George III stated that Indians would be protected under the proclamation and recognized them as nations of Indians. This ensured that treaties will have to be made for development of Indian territories by the settlers. In 1764, the terms and conditions were upheld by a gathering of 2,000 chiefs from across Turtle Island. The Treaty of Niagara was created, and a two-row wampum was presented in recognition of the agreement. This helped re-establish a nation-to-nation -nation basis between First Nations and Europeans. Moving forward to the Canadian Confederation in 1867. Under Sir John A. Macdonald, the province of Canada formally became the Dominion of Canada on July 1, 1867. This dominion included Quebec, Ontario, New Brunswick, and Nova Scotia. This established another superpower in North America other than the United States. But note, the Dominion of Canada was still under British rule. What came from this was the British North America Act, and what is now called the Constitution Act of 1867. Under this, Section 9124, it states that the federal government has power over the subject matter of Indians and lands reserved to Indians. Not long after the Rupert's Land Order in 1870, the Fathers of Confederation looked west for further expansion of the Dominion of Canada. Sir John A. Macdonald requested the transfer of Rupert's Land to the Dominion of Canada. But Rupert's Land was still under Indian rule at the time, though the Hudson's Bay Company only had commercial rights within the territory. Rupert's Land extended from the west of Ontario to the foot of the Rocky Mountains, 49th parallel, which is the United States border, and the Arctic Ocean. Queen Victoria denied the transfer and referred to the Royal Proclamation of 1763, suggesting the negotiations of treaty to be made with the Indians in the spirit of equitable and fair compensation for the Indian lands. Not long after the signing of Treaty 5 happened, the Winnipeg Treaty, or Treaty 5 as it's known, was signed in 1875 in Barons River and Norway House. The treaty was between the Swampy Cree people, Ojibwe, and the Queen of Great Britain and Ireland, Queen Victoria. Representatives from around the surrounding territories came to the signing and took days for the negotiation of the treaty. Adhesions to the treaty happened also in 1876 all the way to 1910. Compensation within the treaty was a token of gratitude from the Queen to the Indians of $5 of the kindness shown by the Indians. Treaty No. 5 territory expands from northern central Manitoba to Saskatchewan and Ontario. One year after our treaty signed, the Indian Act was formed in 1876. Section 9124 creates the Indian Act in Canadian law. 
It is federal legislation that governs over every aspect of an Indian's life. It prohibits traditional governmental systems of Indians. It halts trade, production, and sale of goods Indians required. It restricts and reduces the access of resources and lands Indians had. And the main goal was to assimilate Indians into Canadian culture. Around the same time, Indian residential schools started to pop up around Canada. The Indian Act solidified residential schools into law. They were sponsored by the federal government of Canada, Anglican and Catholic churches, and the schools operated and were geared towards the assimilation of the Indian problem. Identity of First Nations were stripped away in these schools. Their hairs were cut and their languages were prohibited. Abuse of children in these schools have intergenerational effects still felt to this day. The last residential school closed its doors in 1996. This paved the way for many open discussions on social norms to help education and reconciliation. The Natural Resources Transfer Agreement, 1929-1930. The federal government negotiated the transfer of the natural resources within the provinces of Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and Alberta. This was done without the pre-prior consent of First Nations within those territories. This gave legal rights for the provinces in Canada to use those resources for the gain of development. The NRTA stripped First Nations of their inherent and treaty rights of their resources. The 1969 White Paper Controversy Former Prime Minister Pierre Elliott Trudeau and Federal Minister of Indian Affairs Jean Chrétien created the 1969 White Paper, which proposed to reshape relations with First Nations to eliminate Indian status, speed up the assimilation portion of the Indian Act, cancel all land claim settlements, and put reserve lands up for sale. This created a very heavy open discussion on the rights and recognitions of First Nations in Canada. It led to what was founded in Manitoba, Wabong, an outline on the framework of First Nations self-government. The Canadian Constitution 1982 The Canadian Constitution of 1982 created a new way First Nations were seen in Canada. Canada officially became a sovereign, independent country separate from the British Crown. The Crown of Great Britain transferred the responsibilities regarding treaties with the Indians to Canada without the permission of First Nations. Section 35 was created and constitutionally affirmed to protect and recognize treaties, Aboriginal rights, and Aboriginal titles as interpreted by the Supreme Court of Canada. Section 35 goes on to define under their terminology who an Aboriginal person is, and they clump us together with Inuits and Métis. UNDRIP The Working the Working Group on Indigenous Populations took over 20 years to draft UNDRIP to be finally adopted by the UN. UNDRIP united thousands of Indigenous peoples around the world to ensure rights, inherent rights, equality, and justice is found within those nations around the world. On September 13, 2007, the UN adopted UNDRIP for the nations of the world. Kansas, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and the United States voted against this declaration. Though, in 2016, Canada finally adopted UNDRIP. Later on, Canada apologizes for residential schools and the Reconciliation Commission, 2008. Former Prime Minister Stephen Harper apologized to First Nations for the genocide done in residential schools. In June 2008, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was formed to seek justice for First Nations in Canada. It aimed to fix the wrongs done in residential schools as set by the Calls to Action recommendations. This formed a social call for change within Canada to start a dialogue on justice. I would now like to share a portion of the Treaty 5 Statement to the Crown made on July the 11th, 2019 to Minister Carolyn Bennett. For many years now, we have watched our treaty rights being eroded and taken away by federal and provincial laws, in many cases without our knowledge and in every case without our consent. We are sovereign nations who made treaty with the settler crown. 
It was done with the recognition and understanding that we are ind independent people who want peaceful relations with the settler society. Our ancestors never relinquished our title to our lands, waters, and resources. Yet, with deliberate intent and with bad faith, the Crown proceeds after to assert full dominion over lands and territories. This is not the meaning of our treaty with the Crown. Recently, under Canadian law, the courts have recognized the unconscionable act of the unilateral interpretation of treaties. Any meaning that is in dispute should be dealt with politically, and in absence of political agreement, there should be a permanent independent treaty tribunal jointly established by parties to the treaty for dealing with disputes. Our people are resilient, and we shall someday enjoy the fruits of Treaty 5. We will weigh all our options and make wise decisions to secure a bright future for all our people. Canada will no longer remain as the sole beneficiary of Treaty 5. We will make this sacred promise to our people and for the benefit of our future generations of our nations. I'd like to thank you for listening to my presentation. I think it's important that we share a common history and a common memory. Miigwech. Thank you.